Good evening. Good. I'm Jerry Rubin. I'm the director of the Virginia Farm Research Campus. On behalf of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, I'd like to welcome you to tonight's lecture in our Dialogues of Discovery series. It's a real pleasure to be able to introduce our speaker, Corey Bogman. As you can see from reading her bio, I think you all got this on your way in, because I'm not going to repeat all the details of where she got her degrees, et cetera. But you can see from reading this that she's very accomplished. She's won many awards. But what's not probably apparent from reading this, but will soon become apparent to you as you get to know her, she's a very special person. And this was obvious from very early in her career, and I can give you a little historical data on this. There was a book. This book was written when Corey was a graduate student. Uh, uh, Natalie Angier, a science journalist, sort of embedded herself in the research lab where Corey was doing her PhD and observed how people interacted in the heat of trying to do very cutting edge cancer research. And this is what she wrote about describing Corey uh, 25 years ago. So you can read that, uh, and, you'll, and you'll see that uh, it was quite prophetic. But Corey is really the only scientist. You know, we had a lot of accomplished scientists here, but Corey is really the only scientist I know who's equally comfortable being in the pages of Vogue magazine. And if you buy the October issue, you can see the large spread of her in Vogue, this issue of Vogue magazine, as she is in the corridors of power. Corey. <laughs> so hello. Um, thank you for coming. Oh, I'm not on. You're on now. Am I on now? Yes, got it. Thank you for coming, Jerry. Thank you for that introduction. Um, I'm going to introduce my talk today and the themes of my talk today on this slide, which is a painting by Lukas Kranach that's in the museum in Vienna. And it illustrates, it, first of all, I, I love this painting because it illustrates many things that matter to me. Um, the first reason that I love it is that it's beautiful. Um, but there are other reasons that I love it. So first of all, um, this is Adam and Eve, and really at the center of this painting is the incredible bond between them. And you have a sense from looking at Adam that he doesn't care if he's going to get thrown out of the Garden of Eden as long as she's there with him. And the second reason I like it is that there are animals here with them in the Garden of Eden, and the animals have very expressive faces. And you can look at these animals and, and feel perhaps what the lion is feeling and what the elk is feeling, the sort of tenderness in these animals' eyes as well. And that comes up with another theme, which is that we can learn things about emotions and feelings and motivations from studying animals as well as studying ourselves. And the third reason I love this painting is that this is a snake. And snakes look like worms. And I have spent the past 25 years <laughs> of my career studying worms. And so I'm glad to see them have a prominent role here at the beginning of the talk. When you look at the behavior of animals or the behavior of humans, the first thing that strikes you about it is how different it is, how every individual is different from any, every other individual. But when you start to look at the behavior over longer times and gather knowledge about it, you realize that there are patterns to behavior. And this was expressed very beautifully in the early part of the 20th century by the neuroethologist who studied the behaviors of different animals in Europe, Nico Tinbergen, Conrad Lorenz, Carl von Frisch and described in detail the sorts of behaviors that, where you could see patterns. You can see patterns within a species that certain animals will show species-specific behaviors that you can recognize very reliably. For example, the complex behaviors of different honeybees within a hive. And you can see patterns that seem to be similar between species. You can see something that looked like rules of behavior that you see in different animals. So for example, when mating season comes, if the elks here um, encounter each other, there are complicated territorial and aggressive displays and interactions that they have with each other that they use to decide who's going to get to occupy a territory and who's going to get to mate. 
But if you saw two lobsters in the bottom of the ocean negotiating territories, you would be struck by how similar the rules of those interactions were that they used in their aggressive interactions to decide who was going to get what territory. So there seem to be rules for things, particularly in social contexts, for things like aggression or for mating behavior or for patterns of year, rearing the young, where we can see patterns of behavior that seem to be that seem to be in common between species that seem very, very different across evolution. And this makes sense because these are critical behaviors. This is what's required for surviving to the next generation. And this kind of critical survival information is just the kind of information that biology encodes in genes so that it can be passed on from person to person, so that you get some guidelines from your genome, from your biology about how to behave that you can then use to help to make the right decision. So you might ask yourself, what kind of a molecule might be used? What, what would a gene do that was involved in setting up some sort of a complex behavior? And I'm really only going to talk about one molecule and one kind of molecule today. And that's a molecule called a neuropeptide, which is a molecule, it's, a, it's just a small molecule. This is its complete chemical structure. And this is a molecule that is released by nerve cells, and it acts on other nerve cells and on other cells in the body as a signal from one cell to another. Oxytocin was first identified in sheep, and it's known as a molecule that regulates mammalian reproductive physiology and mammalian reproductive behavior. So when a female mammal gives birth, a part of her brain called the hypothalamus pours oxytocin into her bloodstream, and that causes the uterus to contract, so labor is induced in the young are born. It also causes what's called the milk letdown response so that the mother can now lactate and nurse her young. Oxytocin is also released in the mother's brain, and there um, it affects nerve pathways that help her to bond with her offspring, as well as regulating other more complex behaviors. For example, like maternal aggression that will let her defend those offspring. So oxytocin is like the one-stop shopping of mammalian um, reproductive maternal behavior. It gets the offspring born, it gets them fed, and it helps to change the mother's behavior to defend those offspring and to help them become independent. Now, oxytocin is not just found in uh, mothers. Oxytocin is found in the brains of all mammals, of all sexes and of all ages. And it's been implicated in other kinds of behaviors as well, often behaviors that have something to do with social behaviors so, for example, recognition of a familiar individual um, in mice is regulated by oxytocin. Pair bonding in certain rodents, like voles, is regulated by oxytocin. Mating is regulated by oxytocin in many different animals. So, what happens with oxytocin is that these structures, um, that different kinds of hormones and experience and sensory cues cause oxytocin to be released from the brain. It's a small molecule. I'm just symbolizing it here with this little O squiggle. And then it travels to these other brain regions where it interacts with a molecule that sits on the surface of the nerve cells. When oxytocin hits this molecule on the nerve cells, those nerve cells recognize that this signal has been released and they change their properties. And it's exactly that that would happen in cells that aren't nerve cells in the body of the uterus and the mammary gland to also give rise to these outputs. So oxytocin re is released during childbirth. Oxytocin is also released during nursing. Oxytocin is released during orgasm. These are powerful experiences. And that has caused many people to wonder, what would happen if I took a shot of oxytocin? And in fact, people have done exactly that experiment. Scientists have done that experiment and administered oxytocin to people. And um, the answer is, it's pretty subtle. Um, if you want to buzz, you're better off at Starbucks. But there are effects. There, there are subtle effects that you can measure on people's behavior, especially when they're engaged in sort of playing formal games with individuals that they know. And there are effects that you can see by brain imaging on different individuals. And that suggests that you actually can detect some sort of a biological effect 
of oxytocin on the human brain. So this idea has gained just in, um, remarkable traction in popular culture. And I sort of think of this as a bad weed, okay? So you can buy instant trust oxytocin spray, um, which will cause you to beam thoughts into the, <laughs> your companion here. You can buy um, oxytocin Valentine's Day candy here. Um, you can buy clinically proven, doctor-recommended oxytocin factor for stress relief. Um, and there has been a book published that um, calls oxytocin the moral molecule, the source of love and prosperity. Um, can I remind you that oxytocin was first identified in sheep? Um, <laughs> this is completely ridiculous, right? Um, it's so ridiculous that it's generated its own backlash of the uh, schmoxytocin movement. Uh, and you should really take a lot of what you read in the popular press about oxytocin with a grain of salt. So I am not going to tell you anything that's lurid about how oxytocin works, but I am going to try to tell you something about what oxytocin does in the brain and how we can think about what these kinds of molecules do to help us to generate the right behaviors. And this is the take home of what I'm going to try and explain about how behaviors work. So when you look at the brain, um, and you think about the different time scales in the biology of what the brain is doing, the brain has a lot of different parts uh, that have to all work together smoothly for behavior to take place. So first of all, there's a hardwiring of the brain, and that's the brain structure and brain connections. That um, could change slowly over days and months. It's what develops in children. It's changed by your experience. At some level, this lasts a lifetime, although it changes slowly to reflect things like your memories and development. Now, on top of that brain structure is very fast brain activity, and that occurs by electrical and chemical signaling transmission between nerve cells, where nerve cells will release chemicals that act on other nerve cells and will activate them in literally milliseconds, in a thousandth of a second. And when you talk about what's going on in your brain when you perceive and think and throw a baseball and do mathematics, um, that's really these patterns of electrical activity. They're, they're incredibly fast. But somewhere between hardwiring and activity, there's flexible modification of the brain, what I think of as its soft wiring. This is a way of modifying the functions of the brain so that temporarily, for example, over minutes or hours, its responses to these patterns of activity can be a little different. It can be shifted around so that in a particular context, in a particular situation, you can process information a little differently. And this is the role of neuropeptides and neuromodulators. And it's specifically the role of small molecules like oxytocin that are released from the brain to work on this intermediate time scale to try to organize behaviors um, somewhere at the level between the very fast and the lifelong experiences that we all have. So if you want to think about, um, if you want to think about what's happening really fast, you think about at electricity and chemical transmission. If you want to think about slower global effects, you think about neuropeptides and neuromodulators. So how can we understand what they do? So here is sort of the trick that we use in my lab and the trick that many different scientists use to try to understand these processes. Understanding the human brain is unbelievably complicated. Um, understanding any human brain wouldn't necessarily make you completely understand any other human brain. But human brain is built of components. And those components are genes. And they include genes like oxytocin. And humans share most of their genes with other animals. And it's remarkable how shared those genes are. So we think of genes as something like a shared vocabulary for biology. You can assemble the genes in different combinations to build very different things. Just in the same way that you can use a common vocabulary to, build, to write something as simple as a children's book, Good Night Moon, you can use that same vocabulary to write the works of Shakespeare. And likewise, we can use genes to build very simple animals, and we can use genes to build very complex animals. Now, humans and other animals are thought to share about 99% of their genes, and that includes most of the genes that are in the present, in the brain, and it includes many genes that are present in, in vertebrates as well as vertebrates. 
So the trick is that just like in vocabulary, a word means the same thing wherever it appears. In genetics, a gene will be doing similar things in different contexts. And you can try and decode the meaning of that gene, what kinds of functions it has in a simple context, and then think about what it might be meaning in a more complex context. And I work in a very simple context. This is the experimental organism that I study. It's just one millimeter long. It's transparent. Its name is Cenorhabditis elegans, the elegant worm. You can look through it and see its brain here. Um, its entire brain consists of just 302 neurons compared to the 10 billion neurons in the human brain. But this very simple animal, which lives just a few weeks, does a lot of does a lot of different things during its few weeks of life. It can sense touch and heat and light and odors and tastes and pheromones made by other worms. It can learn. It can learn about temperatures. It can learn about tastes and odors. And it interacts with other worms. It mates. It can join aggregates of other worms. It explores. It rests. It eats. So these basic, very fundamental kinds of behaviors are shared between simple animals and complex animals. They have a simple form in this animal. They have much more complex forms in us. But they're sort of fundamental processes that we can reach across space to see. And the thing that makes this an appealing place to understand what genes do is that we could try to understand them at the level of the nerve cells, the intermediate level between the gene and the whole animal and its behavior. So when you think about us, between our genes and our behavior are billions of neurons that make trillions of synapses or connections with each other. Plus, you have all of your individual experience and your, all your own motivations in the behavior. But in the worm, we have many of the same genes, but we have only 302 neurons with 7,000 connections. And so we can try to pick apart this intermediate level and ask, what is a gene doing in the context of these neurons and its connections? How does that relate to what the whole animal does when that gene is active or not? And among the many genes that C. elegans shares with humans is a gene that looks very much like oxytocin and a gene that looks very much like the receptors, two genes that look very much like the receptors for oxytocin in humans. So we can recognize these genes across the vast evolutionary distance between worms as ourselves as being related. So to find a molecule that's related doesn't necessarily tell you that it's doing something similar. But our results suggest that this vocabulary really does seem to have a similar meaning in worms and in mammals. Because C. elegans oxytocin is not made by every cell in the worm. It's not made by every cell in the brain. It's not made by every nerve cell. C. elegans oxytocin is made just in a set or mostly in a set of neurons that are associated with mating structures. It's involved in reproductive structures in worms, just as it is in mammals. So this is a um, hermaphrodite C. elegans. It's basically a female, the big one. And the little slender one is a male C. elegans. He's mating with her using these special structures in his tail. And these special structures um, include nerve cells, a neuron that makes oxytocin, and a number of different neurons that detect oxytocin because they express receptors. So oxytocin is released from this green cell and it acts on these blue and red cells. So what do these, so now we have a molecule. It's, um, we've got it at the scene of the crime here. It's um, somewhere involved in mating structures. What does it actually do to regulate mating? And the first way we ask that question is that we take it away. We knock out that gene. We make a worm that's the same as a normal worm in every way, except that it doesn't have oxytocin anymore. And we ask what that worm does. And what we find is that that worm grows up, and it smells, and it aggregates, and it detects temperature, and it learns. But if it's a male, it gets very confused when it's trying to mate. So males in C. elegans mate with hermaphrodites using a series of different kinds of steps. They respond when they detect her. They back up and turn around her. They search for the right place to inseminate her. And ultimately, they transfer sperm into her. Now, we look at males that don't have any oxytocin. And what we see is that they can do all of these different things. 
that are supposed to happen. But whereas a normal male, a wild type male, will do those things in the right order, one after another, and ultimately be successful, if a male doesn't have oxytocin, he mixes up the steps of these sequences, he goes backwards instead of forwards in the sequence, he forgets what he was doing and starts over again. And the thing that's interesting about that, from that sort of contrast I told you about at the very beginning, is that he can do all of the individual fast steps just fine. He can, he can make the right turn, he can do the searching, he can make contact, but he just doesn't string together the longer series of actions over several minutes that he's supposed to be doing. Oxytocin is not required for, for the individual steps. It's required to string them together into an organized sequence. So this is the first conclusion of what I want to tell you about oxytocin, is that what we do in C. elegans suggests that there really is a shared ancient vocabulary for behavior. We know that there are vocabularies for other biological systems. We know that there's a shared vocabulary for cell division in humans and other animals. We know that there's a shared vocabulary for growth and making DNA across all of biology. And what our results suggest is that that idea of a shared vocabulary extends all the way up to the behavior of the animal. It doesn't explain all of the differences and complexities in the behaviors of these animals, but at the core of the reproductive behavior of mice, at the reproductive behavior of, um, in this case, leeches, and at the reproductive behavior of worms, um, are the same kinds of oxytocin molecules that help to string these behaviors together. And what I've drawn here is a tree of life, showing that these three kinds of animals are very far apart from each other on this tree. And that really tells you that this must have been true way back before they all split off from each other in evolution. And it suggests that something like that is probably still present in our nervous systems today. So not only can we sort of make that sort of a general thought about the way um, these molecules might have evolved, here's what's fun about working on a worm. What's fun about working on a worm is that we don't have to just stop at looking at the gene. We don't have to just stop at the vocabulary. We could try and think about what that gene is really doing in its larger biological context. So maybe we can describe that instead of saying it's the vocabulary, we can say it's the grammar. How does this thing actually work in the nervous system? So we have neurons that make oxytocin, and we have other neurons that detect oxytocin and here indicated in blue and in red because they are making receptors that can tell when oxytocin has been released. And the neuron that makes oxytocin is here in the tail. And here's the kind of question you might wonder about. Well, everything's really disorganized. Um, is oxytocin just around all the time? Is it made at special times? Um, what does the, what, how, did, how do these pieces fit together? Instead of just sort of saying, well, this is needed for that. It's like when, where, and how. What can we do to string these together? And we can do that um, because there are ways for us to actually watch what's going on in the brain of this transparent worm while it's behaving. And we do that using a protein here indicated as the sun to indicate that it gives off light. And this protein gives off light when the nerve cell is active. We can put that protein just in the neuron that makes oxytocin. And we can um, put that together within a male in a mating pair, and we can ask when that neuron becomes active. So the movie I'm about to show you includes a hermaphrodite shown here. Aren't some, of, some of you may be a little young for this. Um, and, uh, and a male shown here. This little bright spot in the worm's tail is actually the male's um, mating structures, which are fluorescent. They're brightly colored. Um, and he's going to move around his mating partner. One nerve cell in here is the nerve cell that makes oxytocin. And right now, that male has just started mating. He's found the partner, and that nerve cell, that other nerve cell is dark. So we can see the bright mating structures here moving along the mating partner. And then somewhere around here, you start to see something happening right there. Still pretty dim. Barely see something right around there. Okay. Now he's going to keep going. He's more or less in the right direction. And now he's figuring it out. 
this is the neuron that makes oxytocin. He's in the right area. That neuron is telling that male that he's done the right thing. It's as bright now as the little mating structures that I showed you at the beginning. So we can watch him evaluating the process of mating. He's starting here. He's got it wrong. He takes a wrong turn. The neuron gets dimmer. Something went wrong. He's thinking. He's coming back. He's got it. The neuron comes back again. Okay, So we can watch this animal evaluating what he's doing in the context of this molecule that will help to regulate his behavior. And so we can say, we can start to put together an idea about what's going on here during mating. But here's this guy. He's getting all these different signals from his mating partner about pheromones, chemicals, about posture and body touch. And that's generating all of these nice, fast movements here, turning and searching and doing all the things he's going to do. And at the same time, he's putting some feedback into this slow pathway that's helping to change this fast pathway that's telling him when he's in the right direction and when he's doing the right thing. And we think that this is, you know, you have to coordinate a lot of different steps, and it takes time. And he's using this to tell him he's, he's doing the right thing. And it's really important to think about why that would be important. So why would you softwire the behavior with oxytocin? Why wouldn't you just respond to all those things all the time? Well, they don't mean the same thing all the time. If you want to interpret the world, certain kinds of information mean different things at different times. So if you've just detected some pheromones and some light touch and someone's just touched your body, that might be telling you that this is a good time to be mating and that's a good time to be releasing oxytocin. The next time someone touches you, you should keep up with what you're doing. If you haven't detected all these things and you get touched by someone else, that could be a nasty predator worm that's about to eat you. Okay? And so the exact same stimulus means something very different when it appears alone, when it's dangerous, and when it appears in combination with these other cues. And that's what this sort of soft wiring that holds things together for a few minutes is doing for the worm's nervous system. So the conclusion to this part of the talk is that this kind of a mating behavior requires animals to coordinate networks of neurons and remember what they're doing, to remember it over time. And for these kinds of short, flexible rewiring behaviors that are going to let you do this behavior, um, the animals are using oxytocin to help keep it together. And as you move up to more complex animals, the behaviors are much more complicated. They um, have a completely different structure, the chemical cues that or the visual cues that start a reproductive behavior are different, but you still have to coordinate lots of different neurons, and you still have to remember what you were doing. And so you use this vocabulary, this one molecule, to help you get those things in order. So I'm now going to go into just a little bit more detail. I want to go into a little bit more detail about how this works um, using another social behavior. So social behaviors I've told you about. Um, were mating behaviors, but of course social behaviors are much more than just mating. Almost all animals spend at least part of their lives in association with other animals for reasons that are not um, associated with mating itself. That's why you see schools of fish or you see migrating butterflies. It's good for complicated behaviors. It's good for detecting predators. Um, and even worms show some associations with other animals, aggregation behaviors that help them to deal with stress. So this little movie here shows you some worms engaged in a different social behavior, aggregation. There are two worms lit up here so that they are easier to detect. And what you can see is that these guys are um, all hanging out in this little group over here. Now, individuals might wander off to check their voicemail and then come back at some point during the, the movie. But you can see that each worm is spending most of its time in the other, with the group. And this represents a real apparent desire to be with each other. The group moves around. Other little groups come. Um, it's the main motivation appears to be the detection of other animals. And this, is a, this kind of behavior is kind of a nice example for us to look like because um, it's a really good example of a soft-wired behavior that animals can use, can show under some conditions and not under other conditions. So um, just as sometimes you feel like being with other people and sometimes you feel like spending some time alone, 
Um, worms like to spend some of their time with other worms, and other, under other circumstances, they'd like to scatter and just graze and do their own thing. And the switches between this are made by another neuropeptide and a neuropeptide receptor. So this isn't oxytocin, it's basically, or it's basically a cousin of oxytocin, the same kind of gene, but a different example that's carrying a different piece of information. And actually, um, this guy here is the loner gene. It's the gene that makes them spend less time together um, than if it were present. So if, if oxytocin, in this case, was driving a social behavior, mating behavior, um, this particular neuropeptide is tending to prevent a social behavior. Now, in this particular case, we can really dive in at a, at a real level of detail and think about what this is doing to the worm's brain. And we can do that because um, when we, we can track down the animal's social behavior to their response to a single cue in the environment, and that's pheromones, the chemicals that are released by other worms. So worms detect pheromones that other worms are making, and we know exactly which neuron they use to detect those pheromones. And that neuron has a three-letter name because there's so few neurons in C. elegans that every neuron has its own name. And we can look at the worm's wiring diagram and find all the other neurons that that neuron is connected to. And when we look at that, we see the following. We see that this neuron here that detects pheromones is hooked up to two different kinds of target neurons. It's hooked up to a set of target neurons that are very important in driving avoidance behaviors. And it's hooked up to a set of target neurons that drive attraction or aggregation behavior. The graduate student who works on this calls this the ambivalent neuron. It, it, it could be either involved in attraction or it could be involved in repulsion. And when this neuropeptide gene is active, the attraction side of this pathway is turned off and the repulsion side gets stronger. And conversely, under other circumstances, the repulsion pathway is turned off and the attraction side gets stronger. So here we have a hardwired anatomy of the brain, and the hardwired anatomy is encoding two opposite behaviors. Because certain smells aren't always good for you. Sometimes there's something you want, sometimes they don't. Sometimes you want to associate with other worms, and sometimes you don't. And you can use this kind of soft wiring with neuropeptides to, in the short term, change your mind. You can turn off part of the pathway and make some of the other pathways stronger and thereby guide the behavior toward avoidance when it's the right circumstances to be on your own. So how can we think about what this would do? Sort of what, what might this feel like if you were experiencing this in your own brain? Um, here's a picture from uh, my lab barbecue at Rockefeller University. We have a very beautiful outside area called the Philosopher's Garden. And every summer, we have a big cookout here. And um, if, you were, if you came to the barbecue and you smelled the smell of cooking meat and you were ravenously hungry, it would be incredibly motivating. You would immediately feel sort of, you would salivate like Pavlov's dog. You would be very aroused. You'd be very motivated. You would go and um, hang out with these guys, see if you could get something from them. Um, if you were not that hungry, um, you might appreciate the smell aesthetically, but it would be much less motivating. It's still the exact same smell, but it doesn't have the same kind of motivational drive. And if, um, like me last week, you were experiencing a bout of norovirus, you would immediately experience a wave of nausea. Okay? And it's still the same smell. You know that it's the same smell. And you wouldn't even be consciously aware, I'm sick, I shouldn't be eating meat right now. But your brain is giving you a shorthand hint, telling you, you know, right now I wouldn't eat that if I were you. And it's not like you've lost free will, right? It's not like you can't still make a decision to eat or not eat based on whether you're vegetarian or whether you don't want to hurt these guys' feelings, right? You still have cognitive control. You're just getting some biological advice, some evolutionary advice about the fact that a GI infection is a time to be cautious. Or when you're really hungry, you should eat this even if it's kind of burnt. Okay? And this is what we imagine that these kinds of soft wiring circuits are doing. 
They're giving you suggestions about what you can do in the context of your own experience and your own motivations. So now I'm just going to return again to, to the larger biological context of what these guys are doing. Um, they're, they're, and again, return to oxytocin and the way these kinds of motivational systems work. I don't know how many of you have seen the YouTube video called Battle at Kruger, um, but it's really cool and I highly advise it. And um, I'm just showing you two stills from that movie without giving too much of a spoiler. I want to point out that when there is one lion and just a couple of buffalo, it's important that the buffalo run away from the lion. But when there is just one lion and there are many hundreds of buffalo, the tables are turned and now it's the lion that's running away. So social context, this kind of social information that you get from these motivational systems is very useful for regulating not just interactions with other lions, but really evaluating your own decisions about the situations you're in. Um, and indeed, oxytocin is known to regulate fear behavior. When oxytocin is high, fear behavior is suppressed. And I'm going to show you an experiment now that, in, that tries to address something about how oxytocin regulates fear behavior. Um, and it's ex an experiment called optogenetics that I think of as hacking the brain. And if it doesn't blow your mind, it really should. Okay? And this is how it works. There are algae, little pond scum that live in ponds, that respond to blue light by becoming active and swimming around. And you can remove from those algae the gene that allows them to respond to blue light. And you can take that gene and deliver it to neurons in the rat. Not all of its neurons, but just some of the neurons. And you now have a hybrid rat algae, where if you shine light on those neurons, they become active. And so you can literally beam thoughts into the rat's brain. Exactly. We don't do this with people. Um, and here's an experiment um, published last year to try to ask whether oxytocin might be involved in fear regulation in sort of an online way. So these scientists. Um, Shown, they, these scientists put the algae protein into the neurons that make oxytocin, so that when they shined light on those neurons, oxytocin was released. And they set it up so that it just released oxytocin into a part of the brain called the amygdala. And the amygdala is a part of the brain that's very important in mammals for regulating fear. So if you put a rat into a novel environment, um, they tend to be very nervous and they'll sort of cower in the corner and be very cautious before they wander around. But if you turn on the oxytocin in their amygdala, they just start running all around. They're not afraid in the least. And you turn the light back off again, and they go back and cower in the corner. Okay, So this is really um, modifying the animal's response to an environment. Again, it knows where it is. But depending on whether it thinks it's alone or whether it thinks it's with companions, it changes its behavior. And I, I just want to remind you of where oxytocin is at its highest levels. Oxytocin is at its highest level in female mammals when they're taking care of their young. And female mammals, when they're taking care of their young, are extremely bold and courageous and even aggressive in defending them. And systems like this are probably part of the hints that evolution gives you that that's the right way to behave under those circumstances. Take risks to protect your young. Um, this is an important thing for you to do. So I've been telling you about animal brains. Um, but I want to tell you that this idea of sort of rewiring or, or self-wiring the brain probably happens in all of our brains all the time. So the human brain has many, many, many overlapping circuits. This is a diagram from a human brain imaging experiment. There are more regions in the human brain than there are neurons in the worm brain. Um, and these are very heavily connected to each other. And in addition to having all these direct connections, the human brain also has many, many neuropeptides, molecules like oxytocin, and many, many neuromodulators. And these molecules probably don't all do the same thing. They probably all do different things. And what we know that they do is to regulate a lot of different behaviors 
that are important and a lot of different sensations. So for example, these neuropeptides are very important in pain, especially chronic pain, in responses to stress, both chronic and acute stress, in regulating sleep and waking, in regulating mood, serotonin, which is the, the, the target of many of our antidepressants, is one of these modulators, in regulating arousal and energy and appetite and more. So we can think about these circuits as representing many different possibilities, a lot of different things that the brain could be doing, and these neuropeptides and neuromodulators as systems that can help make suggestions and can regulate the activity and the flow of information based on um, what the right context is. And we see that one of the reasons that that's kind of exciting, um, not just the sort of an understanding element, but also from a more um, clinical or general framework, is that if you start to think about these systems as having different routes and having regulated routes and being able to make them stronger or weaker with these kinds of fast pathways, you start to think about ways that you might be able to change the flow of information through circuits to make them work better. So you might have, you know, sort of the hardwired part of the brain might be like the roads and the activity on the brain is like the traffic on the roads that's going back and forth. And the neuromodulators are regulating the flow of that traffic to try, try and route it down one road or route it down a different road to help information flow smoothly. And um, this idea is starting to be used to try to, for example, treat um, brain disorders where sometimes when you know that certain roads have been blocked, for example, when neurons die in Parkinson's disease, you might be able to route the traffic down a different route to try to um, strengthen the remaining pathways and help the person's behavior. And exactly that is what we do in a, in a, in a method of um, treating Parkinson's patients called deep brain stimulation. And it really works from this idea about thinking of these as flexible pathways whose activity you can change. And that kind of brings me, I sort of feel like for the last couple of minutes, I should talk about a broader project that I'm involved in now. Um, like many scientists, I was incredibly excited and surprised this year when the president announced that the next great challenge in science for um, his administration, sort of what we might think of as our Apollo project or our genome project or our war on cancer, was going to be to try to be a project to really figure out how the brain works. And um, this is a quote from his um, announcement on that, that scientists need the tools to get a dynamic picture of the brain in action to better understand how we think and how we learn and how we remember. And that knowledge could be and will be transformative. And so, you know, right now we're pretty good at looking at a brain as small as a worm brain. And we're pretty good at looking at one small piece of a human brain or looking at big pieces of human brain. But we, what we want to be able to do is to really understand the flow of traffic through the human brain, the way it works in different conditions, and um, whether we can kind of gear up our tools and gear up our possibilities to look at this as well. So um, I'm part of the National Institutes of Health patch of this. Um, this is going to involve a lot of different agencies in the government and also in the private sector. And um, at the National Institutes of Health, we've been charged with accelerating the development and application of technologies to construct a dynamic picture of brain function that integrates neural and circuit activity over time and space. And so we're going to try to take these ideas about looking at the roads and the traffic and the regulation of the traffic to much broader and more complicated brains to see if we can figure out how they work. And um, this little cartoon here shows you that we think we're going to have to work at all kinds of brains. This is a human brain. This is a fly brain studied here at Genelia. This is a fish brain studied here at Genelia. We'll kind of try and move back and forth between those levels to figure out how these things really work. And if you've been listening to my talk, you won't be surprised to hear that I think to understand that, you need to know what the parts are, what the neurons are, what the maps are, how they're connected what the activity maps are, how the traffic flows. And um, we're going to need a lot of math and a lot of theory. And we're going to need to really relate all that to behavior in real time and across space and time. Um, and we're very excited about the idea that we're going to go back and forth and take what we learn from humans and try and study it in animals. We're going to take what we learn in animals 
and try and figure out what we can apply to humans. We're excited about getting together all kinds of different scientists, not just neuroscientists like me, but mathematicians and physicists and engineers. And we're really excited in a totally nerdy way about sharing data and spreading technology through the community so that we can work together to really figure this out together. So, and you know what makes this such a hard problem is that we all have many brains. And this is a movie that uh, Javier Castellanos from NYU gave me. You know, sometimes you see these things where people talk about what the brain lights up when this happens or it lights up when that happens. This is what a whole brain looks like just when you're thinking. And you know, the red parts are the parts that are more active and the blue parts are less active. And what you can see is that the brain is lighting up all over the place and that the patterns of activity are shifting. Different parts are becoming active, more active, um, or less active over time. And in order to really figure out how this works, we're going to have to look at all those many brains, all the ways that activities shift um, to allow thoughts to take place. It's a, it's a great challenge, but it's a great adventure. And I just want to close my talk um, with a quote from the, one of the founders of psychology, William James who read in 1890 that I think really sums up a lot of the thoughts that I've um, brought you. He says, every creature likes its own ways and takes to them as a matter of course. Clearly, he's talking about instinct. Science may consider these ways and find that most of them are useful, but it is not for the sake of the utility that they are followed, but because at the moment of following them, we believe that it is the only appropriate and natural thing to do. Not one man in a billion when taking his dinner thinks of utility. He eats because the food tastes good and makes him want more. If you ask him why, instead of revering you as a philosopher, he will probably laugh at you for a fool. In short, it takes, in short, a mind debauched by learning to carry the process of making the natural seem strange. <laughs> and I hope today I've done a little bit to help you make the natural seem strange and a little bit to help you make the strange seem natural. Thank you. Ask questions if you'd like. So, um, the worm brain of 300 plus um, thing. Oh. Hello. In the worm brain of 300 plus things, how often are those all wired the same way? That's a great question. Um, so I told you that we know the worm wiring. And actually, that was done for two worms. And they were about 90% the same. And um, we have bits and pieces of the wiring for more worms. And that seems to be about the rule of thumb. But those worms were grown exactly the same way and they were exposed to exactly the same experiences. And we think that in worm brains, just as in our own brains, the number and strength of those connections do change based on learning and experience. So no two brains are going to be exactly alike, probably not even two worm brains. And that's part of the challenge going forward. Um, yeah, the question is when a human sees an image on a screen and you have an instant emotional reaction to it, what is modulating that? Um, the answer is that it will be different things at different times. And I'll give a, I think I'll give an example that might help. So if you're hiking you, and you see like a piece of hose in the road or something, you might think at first that it's a, you might register it as a snake and immediately feel like a little wave of adrenaline. But then a second later realize that it's not a snake and then damp that back down again. So for an instant there, you activated the amygdala and some of the modulatory pathways and the fight or flight response. And then your cortex figured it out and said, no, that's, don't worry, that's just a hose and turned it back off again. 
So you're getting these things sort of playing in. You have conscious control over these pathways. They're not just being regulated. It's not like they're going on without you. They are getting information from your higher cognitive centers that helps you to figure out um, what's going on and whether they should be activated or not. It's all interlocking. It's not you know, sort of from the bottom up in a big hierarchy. It's not the military with everybody over the level above. It's a big conversation where everybody's feeding back and sharing information. Is that? Yeah, so the very first rush is electrical or chemical. But remember that, but again, once you've seen that snake, you'll realize you're not afraid anymore, but you'll still feel the adrenaline for a few seconds. You can feel that that's slower. That's still in your system. Your heart is still pounding a little bit while you're actually calmed down again cognitively. So you can see in that example sort of how your mental process has gone faster than some of the slower modulatory systems. And yeah, the, so the modulatory systems, they can operate on a lot of different time scales. They tend not to be milliseconds like thought. They tend to be more like, you know, sort of a second or two at the minimum. But they can be a second or two, which might be um, something like that response. They can also be hours long, as in, for example, the regulation of the sleep response. So they have a, they've got a range of times. It's not just one time or another. Sure. <clears throat> yes. Could we take like the parts from the other animals and put them together and then take the one percent the the one percent of the human brain that is unique and put them together and make a human brain? Um, we don't know. That's a good question, actually. So I mean, I think the answer is that you could probably replace certain parts of the human brain with parts from animals and still get a good brain out. And it's just like building something out of Lego. You know, so you have a certain number of pieces, and you put them together into something pretty simple, and then you can just reassemble those pieces. And if you have a lot more of them, you could build a much more complicated, much more beautiful um, element out of it. But it's not the piece, you know, the little building block, the little Lego block is still the same. So some of those things would be interchangeable. So really, the special thing about the human brain is not the Lego blocks themselves. It's the number of them and the complexity of the way that they've all been built up into this amazing structure. It's what's called the regulation. Of, um, and a lot of it really has to do with the difference between 302 and 10 billion, right? So you know, there's as many nerve cells in your brain as there are human beings on the planet. Um, and they're all doing things at the same time. They're incredibly complicated. Yeah, so good question. And surprising, if you ask me, still. Supr the answer still surprises me. I thought there were going to be more human genes, for sure. Are the uh, C. elegans that you're using uh, wild type, or do you have a variety of inbred lines that you use? That's a real. That's a, so. Here's someone pretty sophisticated. Um, yeah. So um, we work with we work with lab strains of C. elegans, and they've actually become um, better at living in the lab than they are at living in the wild, and they're better at living in the lab than wi other wild strains are at living in the wild. So um, part of what we do is we try and study some of the wild caught guys and figure out how they're different. So sometimes we look at those. And they're a little different, just as people can be a little different. Um, and then we also do, and this sort of, you know, I only mentioned one of them, but a very big part of what we do is that we kind of surgically eliminate the function of individual genes and then look at worms that instead of having 20,000 genes have 19,999 genes to ask what that one gene does in sort of a subtraction approach. And so that's also a really big part of what we, of how you, you know, you ask what happens when I subtract this, what happens when I subtract that, what happens when I fail to maintain the brakes on my car. Um, you know, you're sort of removing elements and then figuring out what, what kind of changes occur. How long did it take you to do those two worms? I mean, is it a very time-consuming process? If you're going to be comparing a lot of them, is it is it years that it takes to do that? Or so I, you know, I personally am embarrassed by how long it takes me to um, study worms and how much of my life I have devoted to this task. Um, but the the answer is that it takes a long time to get to this level of understanding. Um, but it's still incredibly much faster than it would be for any other animal. 
So, you know, a worm goes from, you know, from the, the mating act you saw to being an adult and ready to mate again, a whole generation is only three and a half days. So if you have one worm, um, you know, in, and, and they have 300 offspring actually. So if you have one worm, you know, in three days you could have 300 worms. In a week you could have 10,000 worms. In two weeks you could have a billion worms. And um, so, so, you know, we have a very fast turnaround and that lets us do things much more quickly. Um, to get to this sort of a point. And, that, and that's part of, the, part of the logic is, let's try and figure out the, the rules in as simple a system as we can, and then we can go back into the more complicated systems and ask a targeted question. Is this rule the same? You know, and that saves a lot of time. That way people working in more complex systems, like the mouse, we, like, we can take 20 wrong turns and then find the right turn, and that might take us two months, you know, because of the three-day generation time. But if you did the same thing in the mouse with the three month generation time, you're talking about years and years. So we're saying let's shortcut that so people can move faster. But yeah, so the experiments I told you about today, those were probably, you know, I told you about experiments that probably took us about four years to do, four years and three people. So I understand that there's 302 neurons in these, in these worms and there's 10 billion neurons in us. And other animals, it's a big variation, and I understand there's a lot of variation in how many connections, but is it 302 in every worm? Is it exactly 10 billion plus or minus whatever in us? And how much variation is there in all these different animal levels? That's a really good question. So in hermaphrodite worms, it's always 302. They, they, that's exactly the same. Actually, males have another 89 neurons in that mating structure in the tail. So that number would be bigger. Um, and as you get to larger animals, you no longer can count each one individually. So as you get to more complex animals, they get much better at sort of throwing a bunch of neurons at something and kind of getting the number more or less right. So probably the number of neurons in our brains might be different by 20 percent. You know, I don't know, some, some number like that. They would still be divided into the same general categories, but we would have the same, maybe we have in our brains 300 new sort of major areas, let's say, and those 300 areas we would probably share. So, you know, we would have that shared function at a larger level. So there's a little part of your brain that lights up when you see faces. It's actually a really interesting um, element that, that, that's got its own special territory. And that's in the same place in your brain and in my brain, you know, and a different part of your brain that, yeah. Yeah, that's, a, that's exactly how we think about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That might be a very large group together. Exactly. I have a, have a, have a question over here. Okay. Hi. Um, if I remember what you were saying at the beginning of the lecture, there, there's this flooding of these uh, molecules that apparently get outside the brain and all around the brain as well to other organs in the, in the body. So an, an effect you're sort of suggesting that there's a, an, an ephemeral connective system that's constructed and destructed uh, over and above the hardwired system. Is that, is that a reasonable exactly interpretation? That's exactly what I think, yes. And you know, and that's a really extreme example. And very often in biology, we learn things from the really extreme example, and then we learn that there are more subtle examples. So most of the time when you get a neuromodulator released, it's not released into your whole body simultaneously. You know, oxytocin is just flooding the system during, during childbirth. Most of the time it's gonna be, you know, parts of the brain, might be just in the brain, might not be released into the periphery and so forth. But this this gives you the sense of how something can be, you know, really, um, it can be acting, but there can be lo more local and more global and even body-wide effects of the sort. So do hermaphrodite C. elegans code for oxytocin, or is that a, a protein that's specific to the male mating structure? Very good. So um, hermaphrodite C. elegans do make some oxytocin. And um, we weren't able to see very much that they did in, um, so 
so I should say, so even I've emphasized one part of what oxytocin do, does. Oxytocin does some other things as well. If it's made in the mating-related structures, it regulates mating, but there's also a little bit made in the brain that regulates learning. And that regulation of learning happens in both males and hermaphrodites. So different sources, different signals can be sending different, different outputs. But um, we've been thinking about that. And it, you know, hermaphrodite C. elegans are kind of a, they're kind of a slightly odd bird. They, um, they're, they don't have to have a mate to reproduce. And so they're really not very motivated. Um, and so we've actually started looking at more closely related species that are true male females. And the females are very motivated. Um, so we think that that might be a better place to kind of pick apart. That, that might be a place to be a little more focused about what act, act, asking what's going on on the female side of this equation. Yeah. The female. Yeah, so we haven't, yeah, so in, in mammals, there's been a lot of work on oxytocin in the female. In fact, that's kind of dominated the thinking. But we also know that it has a role in males. And in C. elegans, we've done more with the males. And we, you know, and we're just starting to think about what to do on the other side, on the female side. Yeah. I mean, all, you know, and again, these, these systems, it, it, there are more things that differ in degree between male and female brains than there are things that are completely black and white between male and female brains. It's just another way of making a brain flexible and smart that you can draw on different kinds of behaviors in different systems. Yeah. I was wondering how did the like neuropeptides and neuromodulators like oxytocin compare with hormones? And with neurotransmitters, like I know neurotransmitters are the really fast ones, but or is oxytocin like a type of hormone? Yeah, that's a really so in the context of it being dumped into the bloodstream, it actually meets the qualifications of a hormone. So you're exactly right. And that was sort of exactly relevant to your question about, you know, what's it doing when it's going out there. So there in the so there's sort of a Fast transmitters like acetylcholine and glutamate are really acting very locally, very rapidly. You know, at the time, at the size scale of a synapse, one, you know, one micrometer, okay, one millionth of a meter. The hormones often act systemically and can act very slowly. Um, things like steroid hormones that can regulate reproductive behavior and regulate gene expression and take place over days. And then the neuromodulators are sort of again, they're sort of in that middle zone. Okay, they don't act just at this very local scale. They'll usually act over a somewhat broader distance, but they don't usually act on the whole body. So they're usually sort of um, regulating a group of neurons, sort of a cooperative of neurons. The example in the males in C. elegans is a pretty good example, right? What's going on is going on just in those male mating structures. It's not really affecting a lot of the um, other behaviors that the male does. So it's sort of a, it, it's right there in the, in the spot in the middle. And that's exactly one of the reasons I think that it hasn't gotten as much play as a lot of the other systems. You know, everybody either wants to work on the fastest or the biggest. And when you're sort of in the intermediate zone there, it's sort of like, well, what's so good about that? But especially when people started doing genetics of some of these systems of really interesting behaviors, and they realized that though that, for example, um, I don't know if you know what narcolepsy is, this really interesting sleep disorder where basically people have sleep invading the waking state and they can suddenly collapse and fall asleep inappropriately or they actually have dreams while they're waking. You know, it's just a breakdown of the division. That's the loss of a single neuropeptide made by 2,000 neurons out of the 10 billion neurons in your brain. And if those 2,000 neurons aren't working, your whole ability to segregate sleep and waking state starts to break down. So things like that sort of brought, brought, these, brought these modulator systems back up to people's attention. And another thing that brought them to people's attention is that most of the drugs we use for psychiatry and most of the drugs of abuse are targeting neuromodulatory systems. So um, Prozac, 
targets the neuromodulatory system serotonin, um, cocaine and Adderall target dopamine, um, opioids target a neuropeptide, um, morphine targets a neuropeptide, heroin targets a neuropeptide. So, you know, those things are kind of telling you something. They're telling you that these systems are important for motivation and behavior in humans, even if they are in that kind of middle zone of not super fast and not super big. Yeah. I'd like you to uh, switch gear to talk about the Brain Initiative. And I think it's a wonderful, wonderful, marvelous initiative. It takes more than just NIH and uh, Howard Hughes. And I know it probably a lot of other institutes are involved in this initiative. I'd like to know the funding for this and whether you have a target date of com accomplished it. Um, so. Okay, so I agree with you completely that if we're going to understand the brain, um, nobody is going to be able to do it alone, and there are going to have to be a lot of people involved, and it's not just going to be in the U.S. It's going to involve people all around the world because there's a lot of great neuroscience in other countries, and it's not just going to involve the NIH, and it's already involving DARPA and NSF. And there's so much to do that it seems like, you know, there's no real reason to fight about it. Um, is this a much better reason for people to get together? Um, right now, you know, the sums of money involved are, are seem like a lot to a lay person. So, like this year, the U.S. is going to give a hundred million dollars. You know, you asked me how long it took me to do these experiments. Um, you know, we're gonna have, if we're gonna really make some progress on the human brain, we have to be thinking about ten years. We can't be thinking about one year. There's only so much you can do in one year in these kinds of systems. We have to look in the long term, and we have to look, and we probably have to look at at larger sums of money. I think um, a friend of mine, Andrew Murray, said, told me that um, if you added up all the money that was spent on the entire Apollo program to put a man on the moon. It was the equivalent of about one six-pack of beer for every person in the United States. And um, so if you did that now, it's about $10 for a six-pack of beer, depending on how gourmet that is. That would be $3 billion. We could learn a lot about the brain for $3 billion. And I'm kind of, this may be sort of um, like very naive, but I think if you ask most people, is it worth it to you? Like, is it worth it to you to have a six-pack of beer if we could give up a six-pack of beer if we could really figure out the human brain? I think a lot of people would say yes. So I'm, I'm optimistic. I think a lot of people are really interested in the brain. I think we need to make progress. It's, you know, all of us know, you know, all of us have a parent with Alzheimer's or a, or a nephew with autism or a cousin with schizophrenia. Like, we know that these are, that they're terrible disorders that we need to do something about. And right now, there's a sense that if we could just learn more about how the brain works, we would start to generate the tools we needed to make some real progress on those problems. So you can't promise that right away, but I think it's the right direction. So I'm optimistic. Do we know if autism is a hardware or software? Um, the, we're just Autism, just in the past couple of years, there's been a huge amount of progress made in understanding, um, in understanding how it happens. And for autism in particular, there's a very large component of, of genetics, of really of biology that's gone a little bit astray in generating it. So there's a very big genetic risk factor. And I think there's a general rule of thumb that the earlier something happens, the more likely it is to have a biological component, and the later something happens in life, the more likely it is to have much more of a component of experience and environment. So when you look at these, you know, when you look at something that happens to very young kids, there's more of a bias. Having said that, now that people are starting to figure out what the risks are, um, very, there's, it's very clear that there are way that there's a range that what they represent is not, is not, um, for the most part, the genetic risks we know about represent really represent risks. You can kind of end up on either side of where that goes, and that with a lot of training, with a lot of education, a lot of people can do better 
and you know, there's kind of hope that if we knew more about what was going on and what was being affected, we could do better still at trying to make those circuits work better. So this is an area of where I think understanding is improving, um, the work that's being done in, you know, in childhood education and really working with these kids is improving and you know, we can kind of hope that those things actually come together so that the science and the, the you know, the um, social workers working with the kids and parents can really get, make some progress. Why is the injected dose of oxytocin so much less intense than what the brain releases itself? That really seems to differentiate it from a lot of other drugs people experience. Yeah, so first of all, the way that people usually administer oxytocin in these human studies is that they snort it. <laughs> I'm not making this up, you know. I, so, and in fact, um, just for, you know, in, fa in fact, um, some very large number of women going through childbirth are injected with what's called Pitocin, which is oxytocin, including you, apparently. And um, so you have, pro so many women have had that experience of having a direct injection. And I guess my, um, my interpretation of that is that most of the time what that's doing is not generating a specific discrete sensation, but that it's priming the system to respond a little differently to other cues. So that it's getting you ready to defend your offspring if some kind of a threat shows up, but you're not aggressive automatically. You're, you're, you're ready to, you know, you're, you're going to interpret other things a little differently when your oxytocin levels are high. Um, listen. Over here. Uh, looking at your research from the perspective of networks, uh, how feasible would it be to look at individual connections between neurons and look at the frequency so you could derive which pathways have the most travel? And particularly, I was thinking about Parkinson's with this question, uh, look at perhaps the best ways to reroute the traffic that you were explaining. Um, yeah. Um... I mean, I think the answer to your question is that I want to know the answer to your question. <laughs> Seriously, I mean, I think that's exactly the kind of scientific question that we need to have the answer to. How strong are these pathways? How much variation is there? Um, you know, what are the side routes? When the beltway is clogged, you know, how else can you get from here to there? Um, you know, I, I think those are really the, I think those are really the questions that we're hoping to solve as a field of neuroscience, speaking for 50,000 neuroscientists. So I think you could join me in thanking Corey again for a great lecture.